It's a movie we waited 14 years for. What brought Bat Brad Bird back into this incredible world? A story where, get this, a woman goes to work while a man has trouble dealing with the kids at home. Let's go back to 2018 via 1958 with The Incredibles 2. It's time to make some wrong things right. Help me bring supers back into the sunlight. We need to change people's perceptions about superheroes. And Elastigirl is our best play. Better than me? <clears throat> Bye, sweetie. I'll watch the kids, no problem. That's not the way you're supposed to do it, Dad. They want us to do it. This I don't way. know that way. Why would they change math? Mm, math is math. Okay, math Dad. is math. Hello? Hey, honey. How are the kids? Everything's great. Ah! Is she having adolescence? And Jack Jack. <laughs> He's in excellent health. What the? Num num cookies. Oh, no. Cooking. Whoa, okay. That is freaky. This is the Superhero Pantheon. On this podcast, we take one superhero film a week and decide whether it should be in the Pantheon, the Pile of Shame, or somewhere in between. My name is Jerome Cusan. You can find me on Twitter at JeromeC1985. You can find additional episodes of this podcast through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and all of your favorite podcast apps through the real world. We strongly encourage you to leave a four- or five-star review so as to help people discover this show and the great work that the folks at The Real World are doing. If you would like to interact with us or send feedback, you can do so in two ways. First, send an email to SuperheroPantheon at gmail.com. Second, find us on Twitter at HeroPantheon. My co-host for this week and every week will be Brian DeBrain. He can be found on Twitter at Brian DeBrain. Brian, we were going to possibly have a special guest and do something else this week, but because of scheduling conflicts and the fact that we are at a pretty chaotic time of the year, being the holiday season, we really just felt like we, we are going to end up doing normal episodes for this week and as we go into the month of December, as we are going to be going back into 2018 and kind of running through all of the movies, including Deadpool 2, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Venom, Aquaman, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. We'll be reviewing all of those movies over the course of these next few weeks. But we thought, since it is the week of Thanksgiving, and Thanksgiving is about family, we thought we should review The Incredibles 2. That only makes sense. Brian, I know this is a movie that we were very excited for at the time that it came out last year. A 14-year wait, being a Pixar movie, being a sequel to a movie that is in the superhero pantheon, being the original Incredibles. But I think we both could not help but be disappointed by this sequel at the time. Brian, upon rewatch, what are your thoughts on The Incredibles 2? Well, first thing, I wish I had a 3D TV at home because, goddamn, the look of this movie, as I said in the original review from last year, just the look of this is spectacular. It's even better than the original, which is, you know, an amazing feat to even top the original look. Uh, unfortunately, it's just the villains, you know. Um, it wasn't as well developed as the original in terms of uh, the original villain from the first movie. I just felt like they should have just went with the Underminer because it just felt like that was the, the right choice. That was a perfect villain. I thought it would have been a great, you know, opportunity for John Ratzenberg to kind of give us that one, you know, he's always had these cameos or smaller roles in Pixar movies. This would have been the first time we had a major role outside of, you know, uh, Toy Story, but like a big major role in a villain in the villain role. And it was a wasted opportunity. I don't know if they save it for the third one later on because, again, the Underminer gets away, but it just felt like that was the perfect setup. And even from the beginning of the movie, it was like, okay, is this going to be what they're going to go run with? The Underminer is the villain, but then you find out later on it's just... He's just a side character, so that kind of disappointed me. Um, it kind of some it left some things on the table because it felt like they left that issue totally unresolved. But then they just go into this other issue with these new characters and the Bob Odenkirk and uh, his sister, and you know, 
the sister being the villain, and we'll get into that a little later, but I thought it was just a little too obvious with her being the villain, and then, I don't know, some of the the, uh, the visuals were really good, it's just the story didn't match up, but I thought the stuff at home with the Mr. Incredible trying to be the father figure, that's the best stuff of the movie. Right, and it's really unfortunate, because here we have the role switched, where we have Elastigirl, and I think she gets one really good showcase scene, I think the motorcycle scene is perhaps one of the best in the movie, I think in a movie without the Jack-Jack and Raccoon interaction, this is that is easily uh, the best scene. I think what sticks out to me most about this movie is that the overall plot line is disappointing, but there are a lot of really positive aspects to this. I still think that this is overall still a fun, good movie. I think there are a lot of really good individual scenes, if that makes sense, Brian. I, I, I watch this movie, and there's a lot of scenes that I really enjoy watching, but it's just there are so many beats where either the plot is too obvious, or th- some of the storytelling just feels a little bit old-fashioned. Right, and uh, I mean, you can't help but bust, burst out laughing with Violet in the restaurant. Like, even the second time around, I just busted out laughing so hard. And then, of course, the raccoon scene, which is unbelievable, uh, with Jack-Jack fighting the raccoon. But, you know, it's it's those character moments, like we you just mentioned, and then uh, even Dash, I felt like he uh, had a, had a few moments here and there, especially at the beginning where they go to the house and it's very much like he's just running amok already. Um, and that's one of the things I kind of wish they kind of um, uh, approached better is that obviously Dash has some issues with like self control, and I thought they would have tied that in more, but I guess they didn't really you know tie that up because by the end of the movie he's still very you know you know picking it things up and touching buttons when he's not supposed to and just you know having no self control. So that that was the one thing that was kind of lacking, but they did focus a lot on Violet, which I liked a lot, and I thought she was much better uh, written in this movie, and I thought they did a better job with her a lot, especially with that romance with the boy. Even though, yeah, they wiped his memory and they kind of had to start over, and that does get frustrating, but I don't know. I just thought that interaction in the restaurant was just, you know, very cute and just so realistic and such a real human emotion kind of thing going on there. And then, you know, to tie it in at the end with the date. But we still never get the date. Like, I want to see them go on that date. So I don't know if they'll ever give that scene to us. I think that one of the things that what happens with Tony is a byproduct of something that I have a real issue with in a lot of movies and TV shows where you are forcing the characters to be stupid and not communicate with one another when in this specific situation it would have been so obvious for Mr. Incredible to communicate to his daughter what had happened Um, So I think that that is kind of where I fall on it. I think it's one of those things where it was kind of deflating to have him immediately just have his memory wiped like it's a Men in Black movie because that's kind of what it feels like this movie has done is it takes some of the, the character progress that was made in the first film and it kind of wipes that away. And part of what makes this so fascinating is that this is the longest computer animated movie ever created up to this point at one hour and 57 minutes. So this is definitely a long-ish movie that where there is some time to develop. And Brad Bird over the years has bristled at the idea of returning to this franchise unless he had a really good idea. One of the things that he said is he would only do this story if he had something really interesting. So his idea was Bob, Mr. Incredible, becoming a stay-at-home dad, while Helen becomes the breadwinner. That was kind of the idea from the beginning, but it took several years for Bird to come up with the perfect story around which to write this idea. And for me, I think about the fact that we have had so many movies and TV shows that have dealt with this concept. If you think about a movie like Mr. Mom, starring Michael Keaton, that is a movie that came out 35, 36 years ago, and basically is the same premise. The idea that the stay-at-home dad is going to be able to take care of the kids, wackiness is going to ensue, while the mom goes out and lives her best life as a working mom, and maybe she doesn't care about her kids as much because she's too focused on her job. I mean, this is a story that we've seen over the course of the last 35 years, done so much to death, that what's disappointing about it is, is Pixar is so good at taking some of the more conventional stories, putting some sort of a twist on them, putting some sort of a their own panache on it, and I did not get the sense that they were really doing that. The story just felt like something that I had seen a million times before. Yeah, definitely got that same vibe too, and that Mr. Mom comparison is a great comparison. It's like very spot on. 
Um, it just felt like they were trying to put this Watchmen spin on it, too, because this whole idea of, like, we don't want superheroes anymore, it's bad, you know, it's they're causing too much damage if they wouldn't... Uh, if Basically, they were saying, the government saying, if that, at the beginning of the movie, if they never helped or, or tried to stop the Underminer, uh, the banks are insured, everything would have been fine, there would have been less chaos and less destruction, blah, blah, blah. So it's very much this Watchmen-type situation where I thought, it's an interesting take and approach, but then it, it kind of gets swept away, and then, you know... Um, it, it, they kind of bring it back with the evil speech at the end, um, but you know it still makes no sense because that speech uh, at the end of the movie that the, the what's the slave? What's her name? The slave screen slaver. Screen slaver. It's so hard to say for me. It just felt like there was just a generic, you know, rambling speech about you know the the heroes and society and how we rely on them and blah blah blah, and then it just went to Watchmen for a PG movie for me. So that was kind of weird. Um, they should have just taken a different approach with it. Um, not, I think just overthinking the villain, I think that was the problem with this movie, um, maybe, maybe they were trying to do a red herring, um, with the brother, with Bob Odenkirk's character, but, you know, I think it just kind of missed, and then everything's kind of felt obvious, and then with the whole idea of the stay-at-home dad, very well played out, but, I don't know, I just thought it was, uh, interesting that they had to see these funny moments at home, but it just felt like a sitcom, but at the same time, those were the best parts of the movie, so... All right, so instead of this movie coming out June 21st, 2019, when it was supposed to, it came out a year earlier on June 15th, 2018, Pixar actually swapped the release dates with Toy Story 4 as this movie was filmed and completed ahead of schedule. And it's funny because if we were to talk about Toy Story 4, I would actually have a lot of the same criticisms of Toy Story 4 as I do this movie, even though I kind of think Toy Story 4 is a little bit better. But we could do that another time. Another thing that is noteworthy and different is that there is a different person voicing Dash since the previous actor was too old, Spencer Fox. So this time we got Hunk, Huck Milner doing the voice, and he is the only major voice uh, change uh, from the previous movie as all of the other characters pretty much return. One of the more notable characters to return, of course, is Frozone's wife, Honey. She once again does not appear on screen, but she is again heard yelling at her husband from off camera as he runs off to don his super suit and help the Parr family. There is also some references to New Math, which was something that was going on in the 1960s and sadly is also rev is sadly also relevant in the year 2019, Brian, because we just don't know how to teach math, I guess. God, this was such a relatable scene for me personally because I've had that exact frustration of just, like, having arguments with a math teacher of just, like, listen, I got the same answer as you. It doesn't matter what way we got there. We got the same answer. And then it's just this arguing and arguing. And then it just I was just so relating to that scene with him and his kid. Math is math. And I kept thinking in my head, God, I know exactly what he's saying right now. And I just pictured this exact conversation I had with my sixth grade math teacher. And I'm just like... Fuck, man. What, why is it so complicated? Who cares about the formula? We just got to the same answer. That sidebar brought to you by New Math. All right, so the other reason that I'm kind of critical of Pixar in this way is because this is yet another film where the protagonists kind of switch roles. In this case, Mr. Incredible and Mrs. Incredible switch roles. This is something that happened in Cars 2. This is something that happened in Monsters University. And this is also something that happened in Finding Dory. So I think that is kind of where my criticism lies in that you're kind of doing the same thing that these other movies have already done. And in a way, I think those the, all three of the sequels that I just mentioned are far inferior to the original, and I think The Incredibles 2. I think the only, the only, the best franchise within Pixar ha has to be Toy Story. I would argue that Toy Story 2 is at least as good as almost any other Pixar movie, but it just seems like with a lot of these Pixar sequels, as it is the case with many sequels, that there's sort of a diminishing return. Yeah, and I don't know if that's just because it's the numbers game, where it's like, yeah, let's say they introduce a new character to focus on, right? And, um, you know, you got f five other family members there, right? So um, it would be too many. So I think at this case, it's like, yeah, let's switch the focus. But I don't know if maybe they should have just focused more on Violet, because she seemed to be kind of the focal point for me, of the, like, in terms of, like, 
the fresh, interesting new storylines that they're doing for the, the sequel, like, that was the best stuff for me. So, um, I don't know if she, 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 she should have got the more focus, or, like, maybe the starring role, but, I don't know, maybe just focus more on the kids, where the kids, because in the end, yeah, the kids had to save the adults, and maybe, maybe that, maybe they should have just made that the whole plot of the movie, where at the beginning of the movie, the parents get kidnapped, and then it's the whole time, where it's Jack, Jack, Dash, and Violet just trying to go through, throughout the whole movie and get their parents back, I think that would have been more interesting, to be honest, going up against Underminer or something like that, but, um, they kind of went with this Mr. Mom kind of feel to it, and I, I kind of get why they did that, because it's the time frame, so it kind of fits the role, but at the same time, I don't know, maybe they should have just jumped the, the time jump, maybe like five years or something, to get away from that. Right, I think that that is unfortunately a byproduct of waiting 15 years, is that it kind of feels like, well, how have things changed in the last 15 years? And while I understand starting the movie with the Underminer and kind of going with that, the fact that there is just kind of a continuation of this first movie, it, it feels frustrating because it feels like the the way that the, the film industry has evolved so much, the way that we think about superheroes has evolved so much, and in a way, this movie feels like it is a byproduct of a very different time and i think you get that with screen slaver screen slaver in theory is an interesting character but it's not really something that's relevant for the 1960s the 1960s yes you had television but you didn't really have a lot of other screens you didn't have cell phones you didn't have tablets you didn't have computers and granted this is a slightly more advanced society but we don't see we don't see Dash going on the internet, for example, to look up things. It's it's not that advanced. So I think that's one of the issues. And it's like they're, they're trying to do the same thing that, in a way, I think Teen Titans Go to the Movies was also doing, where they're talking about the idea of being a slave to the screen or, or and relying too much on superheroes. And ultimately, I just don't think that it works because in this world of The Incredibles, there is not an over-reliance on superheroes because they've been banned already. So I'm, I'm not, I, I wasn't sure of where they were going with any of this, and I really wish that they had done some sort of a time jump, and I can get into this when I talk about my theory and the burning questions, but I think that, that my issue was with Screenslaver, and there were some literal issues with Screenslaver, as unfortunately, there were a lot of scenes that had rapid flashing lights, and this caused people to have seizures, and that is kind of one of the unfortunate legacies of this movie is that that's what it did. And Brad Bird is also somebody who has come out and talked about The Incredibles 2, not necessarily being a kid's movie and kind of getting into the semantics of what a kid's movie is and whether this should be classified in the same way as Marvel or Lucasfilm. And I'm not necessarily sure how how I feel about that aspect of it, because I think Incredibles 2 is definitely a much darker Pixar movie, but, like, for logistical reasons, I don't think it's necessarily worried about... Be, I don't think you should necessarily be that concerned about it. Yeah, it's just weird that they went with that screen slaver villain, because that's very much a modern-day type of villain. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work unless you have, like, cell phones and, like, you know, tablets and all that kind of thing, and the only thing they really had was the tube TV, even in 1958 in this world. So, if anything, it should have been more about satellites and maybe, like, space, you know what I mean? And space travel and getting to the moon or something like that. That's more relevant to that time, you know what I mean? So, um, but maybe it was just Brad Bird trying to, you know, overthink things a little bit too much, you know? He, he kind of does that. That's one of his weaknesses, like... Um, Tomorrowland, I think he kind of overthinks a little bit there too. So he, he does have his moments, but he'll have his strengths like in developing the like, strong character. So at least the characters were still pretty strong in this one. I got to give credit for that. Um, but yeah, it's weird that they had like that Simpsons effect. I don't know if you remember that 90s episode where he goes to Japan or whatever and they, they, say, they show that commercial and people are having seizures. <laughs> it just was the same thing. But you'd think that animators would learn from that by now because this is like the third or fourth time that this has happened with animation and, like, causing seizures and stuff. I think it was, like, a Pokemon episode as well. Um, it's just weird that, you know, you don't really think about these kind of things, and then it's like, oh, it's too late now, and it's already in the theaters, and it's already causing problems, so. But you live and you learn. Definitely, and the Underminer gets away and is never caught during the movie, so the Underminer has gotten away, and we may never see him again. I'm not sure if we are ever going to get a chance to see an Incredibles 3. We could talk about that with the burning questions, but let's actually get into the categories now. 
This is a movie about Elast- Elastigirl. She gets a lot more to do, including a really awesome motorcycle scene. Her journey is meant to mirror what happened to Mr. Incredible in the first movie in a lot of ways. So, Brian, any what are your thoughts on kind of the motorcycle chase sequence and her plot line from her perspective? Well, first of all, she's having the time of her life. You can hear like how awesome and how much like how many she has in the in the voice booth like it translates so well like that scene where she's talking about her day on the phone in the hotel room that's one of my favorite moments for her because she's just so happy and she's so like ecstatic you know what i mean and it's so great to hear that for a character like that and then that scene like the second time around i didn't even realize that she's stretching uh the motorcycle and the motorcycle is actually in two parts it's not one singular piece so that really blew my mind the second time around. Cause like, how did I not notice that the first time that the, the motorcycle is actually in two pieces? So that was pretty well designed. Cause like, even I look at the toys, the toys don't um, exactly have that kind of uh, design when when I saw the, especially the pops. Cause there was like this pop that came out of the motorcycle as well, and I was like, yeah, it's pretty basic. It's not as cool. I don't know why they picked that. And then the second time around, I'm like, no wonder they picked the motorcycle. It was so badass. And I couldn't believe I just forgot about that part the first time around. So that was really cool. And that whole sequence where she's counting, uh, pretty much counting how much track is left. And she's trying to figure out and calculate how much time she has to catch it. And then save it from falling off the edge of the track. And then it kind of barely te- uh, teeters over. That was so well done. And her kind of hero's journey. You know, I get why they did it. You know, it's, you know, women empowerment, women in the workplace. I get why they're doing it. It's very much... It fits the theme of this time. Um, unfortunately, it's just we've seen that kind of way too often in movies and TV. But, you know, um, I thought it was cool that she became, like, this singular figure. And it was cool that she was, like, this, like, hero on TV again and brought the four, you know, superheroes back kind of because of her. Um, and it was cool that she was pretty much outsmarting everyone, even though, like, it's obvious who the villain was. But, you know, it was pretty cool that she got the... She figured it out, basically, like, with, like, 45 minutes left in the movie. So that was pretty interesting. And, of course, there is also Mr. Incredible. He has problems at home with the kids, and he seemingly gets left behind and does not have a whole lot to do, but he kind of does save the day in his own way. And one of the things that I really do appreciate from a visual design standpoint is there is a point when he's not getting a lot of sleep, and you see the 5 o'clock shadow, and you see his eyes, and that is something that Pixar is able to do so incredibly well to 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 cover this and to just make it look so real and you really feel Mr. Incredible's fatigue and I think that is a testament to just how good Pixar is at what they do from a technical standpoint is getting that look down throughout the movie yeah it was so great because you know at first he's pretty normal and then throughout it's just getting worse and worse and worse and and then after he finally falls asleep for 17 hours his eyes are pretty normal so that that was a nice little detail as well. It's like they really paid attention to all these details. And, you know, with, like, the technology now, you can add these these little things that kind of add to the character development. So that was pretty cool. And the kids, of course. Jack-Jack battles a raccoon. The sequence is great. Violet and Dash save the day after their parents and Frozone are mind-controlled. The Incredibles come together once again in a really great finishing sequence. Even though things do get a little bit dark at the end and... I think the Jack Jack the Jack Jack stuff is really funny, but it's one of those things where there's a reason that they deleted that scene from the first one where he's acting all crazy and whatnot, because there's so much to do with Jack Jack because his powers are so ubiquitous that it almost becomes a distraction from the rest of the movie because it's like, well, what's Jack Jack doing? What is he going to do now? Is he going to turn into a demon? Is he going to transport? So it's it's one of those things where it's really hard to focus on the characters at a certain point, and especially the second half of the movie feels like it's very Jack Jack heavy, even though a lot of the character development is with Violet. You know, I think some of the, even Elastigirl kind of becomes short shrifted in the second half because so much of this is about, you know, we get a giant Jack Jack, you know, that's something that happens. And I'm not saying that that's, that's necessarily a bad thing, but in a movie that is one hour and 57, one hour and 57 minutes long, I think what you run into is the case, like the case with so many sequels is you get some bloat. And I think that's an example of that. 
Yeah, I think it's too much of a good thing, and yeah, you're right. It was the same thing I was thinking, like, it's it probably could have cut, like, ten minutes out of this with less Jack-Jack stuff, and you could have just put it on the Blu-ray as, like, extras and make it special features. Um, maybe not the Edna stuff, but, like, some other smaller scenes, but definitely, yeah, it just kind of felt like it was a little too much. Because, um, really, he, he doesn't have a story arc. It's not like he has, like, a character's journey. He's just, like, a baby that just has powers, right? He can't even talk. He can't communicate well, so there's no really an arc for him to have. Um, and unfortunately, Dash doesn't have an arc in this movie at all. He's just kind of in the background as well, just trying to learn math. And even with the learning math stuff, there's no, like, you know, parallel or allegory that came from it as a life learning lesson later on. So that was kind of disappointing. I did like the fact that Violet did have a full arc, and that was really great. And the fact that she was able to accept her powers, at first she kind of rejected it because it kind of, like, caused some issues for her in her real life, which is very, you know, superhero, you know, common stuff about identity and stuff like that. So... Um, very much on the trope, on the nose on the trope for that, but at the same time kind of accepting it at the end and getting the suit back and, and initially throwing away the suit and then taking the suit back and reclaiming it. That was that was a good character arc moment, so that was really great, and she had a chance to shine. Um, so that's why I was kind of thinking, like, maybe she should have been more of the focus and maybe the parents should have been kidnapped way earlier in the movie and the whole movie is them trying to get their parents back. I'm not necessarily w- sure where to put Void, but... I really appreciated the design of her powers, and I wish that there almost had been more of her and kind of the rest of that that team. And in a way, I almost wish they were the villains of this movie, and it was one of those things where the Incredibles have to come together as a family to defeat a team of kind of evil heroes, I guess so to speak, or kind of the the dark Incredibles, if you want to refer to them as that. I mean, I guess Void is also ultimately considered to be a hero. She's probably the one that gets the most to do. Uh, Crush doesn't really get a lot. The Magneto ripoff doesn't get a lot. Um, so I, I had a real hard time coming up with a hero score just because I think there was a lot of good stuff, but there's also some stuff that I'm kind of mixed on. I am going with the seven because of the motorcycle sequence was so well executed, Jack Jack and the raccoon, what they did with Violet and at least trying to showcase her. We didn't talk about the end of mode scenes, but I really like those scenes and kind of her explaining what's going on with Jack Jack, kind of the James Bond like sequences. So that's where I come down as a seven. Um, I'm going to go with an eight and I'm going to add in someone we forgot. We forgot about Frozone and Samuel L. Jackson does a great job at Fro- as Frozone. But I, what I really liked and what really impressed me was at the end when he's using his powers and he's using it to freeze the water in order to help stop the ship. And I can't help but thinking, like, man, this is way better than any of the X-Men movies have used Bobby Drake as Iceman with his powers. Like, way more in, like way more thought out, way more creative way to use his powers. It's like the frozen ice. I always thought Bobby uh, in X-Men was just kind of like a, a weak X-Men character because he didn't really use much of his powers, even though he has a really strong power and he can do cool things. They just never really thought of ways to do cool shit with it. And finally, here you see Frozone do this amazing feat, which is probably more amazing than some of the other feats in the movie. I mean, that's a whole body of water he had to freeze just to stop the ship. So, credit to Samuel L. Jackson and Frozone, and that scene looked incredible. So, I'm going with an 8, because just strong performances from all around, and, you know, the violent stuff I loved. The, vi- the villains, I think what you get here is you get some changing perceptions of superheroes as they try to incorporate the kind of the use of body cameras. And really, this this movie is, it's really obvious that one or both of the siblings were going to turn. They teased the fact that it was going to be Bob Odenkirk, because Bob Odenkirk was in Breaking Bad, and it only makes sense, as he was Winston Deaver. But it is Evelyn Diener, who is played by Catherine Keener. Uh, Catherine Keener was also somebody who did some hypnotizing in another movie that came out this year, that being Get Out. And that's also what happens here. So a lot of mind control with Katherine Keener. It's a big thing for 2018. I think turning the, the heroes is an interesting idea, but in a PG movie, it's really impossible to go all the way with that. And the Deavers aren't nearly as interesting as Syndrome. The Deavers aren't nearly as interesting as I think Brad Bird thinks they are. And for those reasons, and the fact that we don't really get enough time with Evelyn to make her feel important, there really is no connection between her and the Incredibles like there was with Syndrome and Mr. Incredible. It was just really hard to accept the Deavers as the main villains of this movie. 
Yeah, and the the bullshit reason that Evelyn gives is that you know her parents are killed in a in a break in. Um, the idea is that he the parents called for the heroes because they had a direct phone line to some of the heroes, but at that time the superheroes were already banned, so they can't legally answer the call. So they end up getting shot and killed when the whole time Evelyn just saying, "Let's just go down in the basement and stay safe and call the cops." So he, I guess she blames all heroes, which is kind of stupid, when in reality she should just blame the dude who actually shot her parents. So there you go. So just kind of this stupid kind of like logic and like this revenge plot that kind of comes out of nowhere. And the fact that she just looks stoned throughout the whole movie, and I know that we talked about this last year, but um, man, she just looks really laid out and stoned and just not caring. And everyone else is just wide-eyed and normal, but you can tell like she has been either on like smoking pot or something, I don't know, but I don't know if that was on purpose but it damn sure looked like she was in it to be to look stoned. So, uh, overall, I'm going with a six just because it's kind of underdeveloped and it's so obvious who the villain was. And, you know, Underminer, man, lost opportunity there. I'm also going with a six, and I think a lot of it is because I did appreciate kind of what they did in theory with the mind control stuff. I think that is kind of part of the villain aspect of things. I, I like the Underminer sequence. I thought it was way too short, but I, I do like, in theory, what they were attempting to do. I, I just walked away frustrated with the fact that I think Jason Lee did a really good job of kind of cartooning it up in an appropriate way. I mean, this is an animated movie, so I think as a villain, you can go bigger. And it just felt like, in this case, Brad Bird, Brad Bird was kind of going for the opposite effect, and it did not work nearly as well. All right. Let's talk about the story. It's not a good sign when they literally wipe the memory of one of the characters. And it's like, like I said, they it's like they wiped away the character progress as well. I think the battle with Underminer looks great, but it's basically done by the nine minute mark of this movie. We get eight minutes of them as family, and then it's back to kind of where they were in the first movie with them being divided and the parents not really wanting the kids to behave like heroes. I like the idea of the screens, but again, it's not something that's really appropriate to take place in the 1950s and the 1960s. And like I said, I get similarly to the villains. I think the actual plot points of this movie are a little bit frustrating. Yeah, it feels unbalanced. Like, yeah, we we criticize like the Mr. Mom kind of aspect of the movie, right? But that stuff at home is like really well done. It's like it's very sitcom-ish. In, in a way, but, you know, good kind of sitcom, you know what I mean, where he's just laughing hysterically at, like, little random things and little developments that go on in the house, but then it cuts back and forth between the screen slaver stuff, and then you kind of feel like, oh, this is kind of like a generic superhero thing going on on the side here, and you want to, you want to, in your my mind, it felt like my mind wanted to focus more on the family stuff at home, and less on the screen slaver stuff, which is kind of distracting, you know what I mean, and it's just kind of like, okay, let's, it feels like I'm just kind of sitting through these scenes with Screen Slaver and the stuff at, at the uh, the office and, like, you know, the Bob Odenkirk stuff, and they're just kind of going through the motions in my head. And then it's just really like, man, I just kind of really want to focus on the other stuff at home. So that was kind of, you know, it's disappointing. Because, um, man, that Jack-Jack stuff is great, you know, but it's it's such a big imbalance for me, you know what I mean? So, again, I'm going with a 6. I wanted to give it a 7 so bad, but I just, I couldn't do it because I just felt like the, the villain was underdeveloped and just so many obvious things, and, you know, um, and then just the, you know, the inappropriate kind of technology kind of fitting in, in the wrong kind of era, you know, it just didn't fit well. Now, we've kind of gone low the last two, but I think for this one, this is by far my highest score, because I think this movie looks incredible. There are some clear advancements from 2004. I think the city itself looks spectacular. I do appreciate the fact that from a visual perspective, this is completely different from the first movie. The house where they're at is different. The city compared to the island that they were in. I I love the fact that they just made this completely visually different from the first one, and it's so distinctive in a good way. I think where you see the technical stuff is the scenes that we've already been mentioning and I think that Michael Gaikino's score is also really excellent once again. I think it, it's a little bit of a repeat from the first one, but again, I think the way that he is able to kind of give this movie the feel that it deserves, I think, is really is really tremendous. And that's why I'm, my technical score is a 9. I'm going all out. Perfect 10. And uh, for me, it's just the little things that I notice. Like, the colors are much richer and much more 
blended well with like darker colors going from like the darker red to the lighter red and I, I mentioned that before on the main logo um, I just thought they just blended you know darker colors with the brighter colors well and like oh man I thought the score was fantastic um, the one scene in particular I mean, it's just so random but I just noticed these things it's like the the scene where Mr. Incredible is fighting uh, Elastigirl in the shadows right and it, it cuts you know it's going like through these shadows and patches of light and patches of shadow and you can see the colors the way it's animated that whole sequence with the shadowing and, and the shading on, on, on the suits from the the light oh my god just incredible like the, the amount of patience and the amount of time to animate that the little details like that just incredible and then we mentioned the underminer stuff but in particular i think what was crazy to look at was the drill with the un, under uh, underneath the building and then mr incredible's trying to stop the drill the amount of detail that was going on in the frame rate that, oh my god, like, the first time I watched that, I was just blown away. Second time around, I was just wishing that I had, like, a 4K TV with 3D to watch that again, because it didn't do it justice. I thought it looked fantastic again. But man, like, it's... So many details. So many details. Yeah, they definitely got the details on the technical part of this extremely well. And I think that's a real testament. I think the reason that I am not willing to give this a full 10 is that from an editing perspective, I don't think the pacing of this movie is is where it should have been. So that's why I settled on a 9 instead of a 10. I get that, but I, I, I attribute that more to the, the script writing, and that's kind of how the script was designed. So I think that kind of editing was kind of already laid out in the uh, the script writing. Sometimes you can take editing kind of just kind of turn things around and improve it, but I think they were just kind of given the script and had to go with it the way it was. All right, let's talk about the legacy of this movie. This movie made a ton of money, made a billion dollars. But it's it, it felt like it kind of came and went in a way. I feel like I feel like Toy Story 4, I feel like there was a good couple weeks of conversation that was happening after this movie and it, that wasn't the case with The Incredibles 2. And I think people were were highly anticipating it. You can't call it a disappointment from a box office perspective because it made more money than the first one did. But I think from a creative standpoint, I think there were people that were that were pretty disappointed. And I think I think the story of this is that Pixar continues to be really successful. They're really good at what they do. The movies look spectacular. But I think their creative output is kind of on a downturn right now. And I see that with both Toy Story and with this movie and even going into a movie like Cars 3 and Finding Dory. I think they're on a little bit of a creative downturn right now, but you certainly cannot deny that they are still really successful. So my score is a 7. I'll go one point higher. I'm going to give it an 8 just because looking back, I mean, this was a financial juggernaut, right? I mean, $600 million, I think still to this day is what the highest grossing animated domestic of all time. That may be the case. I'm not sure I could go to Box Office Mojo and look yeah, that up. Because I, I just can't even think of another animated movie that even touched 550, right? And I'm not even including Lion King, uh, the new one. You know what I mean? So I just felt like the legacy is just incredible success box office-wise. And to me, like, there's something about the Jack-Jack character that's still really kind of like popular uh, from this movie. That's like the one... It feels like that's the one character that really sticks with people. And obviously it's, you know... It's a little slapstickish, yeah, but, you know, people love him, and he's still growing as a character, even though 14 years later he hasn't really aged, you know, kind of that Simpsons effect, but hopefully, I don't know, there's there's opportunities now, especially with Disney+, Plus. there's a lot of different opportunities, maybe even a show, to grow these characters, and, I mean, I think Jack-Jack is kind of the draw right now, out, out of all these characters, so, um, to me, he's kind of what makes this franchise that can, keep, that can keep the franchise going, basically, in the future. And it's, he's a baby, so there's a lot of time to develop with him. I mean, the incredible thing is, is that this movie made $1.2 billion, which is just simply a remarkable amount of money. And I think that is that is not something that should be underestimated, because it beat Toy Story 4, for God's sakes. It beat it by almost $200 million, which is amazing. That's what I'm saying. I, I think there's something to... I don't know if it's Jack Trick or whatever, but maybe just the, the, the whole design concept as well is kind of a draw within itself, right? Because people love, every time you mention The Incredibles, everyone mentions the look. Like, that's one of the first things they mention is the look. So I don't know, maybe it's just the aesthetic that kind of adds something to it, but it's definitely a draw, this kind of franchise. And it's not necessarily, like, maybe the older, you know, parents, but it's definitely the kids that see something in, like, Jack-Jack and maybe just the animation style. 
And I will point out that The Incredibles 2 made almost double what the first one did, which is also crazy. Insane, especially, I don't know, last year was just, you know, especially with Infinity War coming out. I mean, even the last two years, it's been like box office heavy competition in the summer. And to pull those numbers out, it's still incredible. I mean, I think that speaks to the power of Disney and just their brand. And I think The Incredibles 2 came out far enough after Avengers Endgame to where it did not affect it. I think I would make the argument that Solo was more of a victim of the the Avengers Infinity War blast or the snap, so to speak, than uh, than that was. But my total score, Brian, is a 35. Mine's a 38. Um, yeah, it's about right. Like, I, I think story-wise, obviously, the first one's much better. Um, I think just technically, um, this, I think, kind of tops it a little bit more. And then, of course, the legacy stands with the amount of money it just made, you know, after 14 years. You know what I mean? All right, let's get to the burning questions. On a scale of 1 to 10, what was your disappointment level in this movie, you know, I don't want to say it's too high. I would say it's a, it was a six, just because I just felt like the villain was under kind of developed and it was so obvious. But again, man, look, John Ratzenberger doesn't have a lot of time left on this earth, people, and to him to have this one big role in a Pixar movie, I think he, they owe that to him, right? But maybe he just doesn't want it. I don't know. Maybe it's too much. He doesn't want too many lines. But I just felt like. This would have been the perfect opportunity to do that. That was my bis- my biggest disappointment was the underminer stuff. Yeah, I think that I think that scene in particular was disappointing. I would say a five or six is is appropriate. That's about where my level is. The, my level was at, and sometimes I feel like I feel that more on the rewatch than I did even the first one. Um, but you definitely. Definitely some disappointment there. Jack Jack versus the raccoon. Best scene in either movie? I want to say yes, but I want to say number two might be, I don't know. I just found that stuff with uh, Mr. Incredible in the office in the first one with his boss just incredibly hilarious. So that might be my number two, but it, it's definitely neck and neck. And uh, maybe number three is the scene of the first one where the um, Elastigirl's yelling, there's kids on the plane, stop, and that whole dramatic effect that was going on there. So maybe those are like the top three with this one being number one. Because I, look, man, I live in an area where there's a lot of kind of wildlife in the, not a lot, but just raccoons and possums and stuff. So I've been there, man. I've not gotten a fight with a raccoon, but I've shot one in the face with a BB gun and it just stared back at me one time. So there you go. Wow, that 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 did not go in the direction that I was expecting. I, I would say that from a technical standpoint, this is the best scene in either movie. I think you could make a really strong argument for the Elastigirl scene, where she's just stretching all over the place, and I certainly would not argue that, but I think this one is the best. Didn't the Underminer technically win, Brian? Is he the greatest villain since Thanos? He did win, man. He got away, and he stole the money, and, you know... There wasn't even a word of of him afterwards, so is he up there with Thanos? No, but technically he's more successful right now because we don't know. We technically don't know his future since the video game canon is out the window now. Um, he's still out there technically, right? So maybe after all these years they make a, another sequel and we get it where it's like the Underminer is like 100-something years old and he's lived this long and he's just been getting away the whole time. I think that's that's the case. I am not going to say that he's the greatest villain since Thanos, but I will say that uh, he did a hell of a job. He he defeated the Incredibles, and he has gotten away with it, so good for him. What would have made for a better Incredibles 2? Um, man, Underminer is the villain. Uh, maybe the parents, like I said, getting kidnapped in the beginning and then having the kids be the focus and then having them have to, like grow up kind of really quickly and kind of mature really quickly in order to, I mean, they're born superheroes. They kind of have to deal with it. They're dealing with it now as kids. So you might as well just start becoming adult and kind of becoming that hero role that you were born to be anyway. Right. So I think that would have been a better direction. Um, no offense to Bob Owen Kirk and stuff like that. It's just like, you know, they could have done better with him. I did like his enthusiasm though. He was very happy and like, you know, he was very genuine with his approach to caring for superheroes. So I'll give him that. I really wish that they had focused on that team that was l- basically led by Void. I almost wish that they had been the antagonists to the Incredibles and that the idea would be instead of kind of doing the story, having forcing the Incredibles to actually come together as a superhero family, perhaps create some separation of time. I think that would have perhaps worked out uh, for the best. 
what would you want to see out of an Incredibles 3? I guess just the 70s and a time jump, and I think the 70s would be perfect. Um, I want to see Frozone in the 70s. I want to see, you know what I mean, like the, the style change, but keep that, that animation style the same, but keep the, the styles change within the world and the culture. That's kind of what I want to see. Um, and then again, like, God, I want to see Jack-Jack grow up, man, and just kind of develop and actually start, you know, have conversations and see which powers stuck. You know what I mean? Did he Maybe he just took all the powers, and he's like the ultimate superhero now, but he's like struggling with it because he's still a teenager trying to pass high school. Maybe that's the story to tell. I don't know. Yeah, I think a time jump is in order. I would almost like to see another director go into the director's chair for The Incredibles 3. I think Brad Bird has a very specific sensibility, and I'm not sure if that sensibility is aging very well in the modern way that we make movies these days, and I think that that has been shown by his recent output. I think I feel like a lot of the same problems I had with this movie are the ones that I had with Tomorrowland, and just the way that the movie was executed. I think he's a really good visual stylist, but I think the storytelling has had a lot to be desired, and what I am very curious to see is Disney Plus is kind of gonna, is going to change the game as far as how these movies are made and whether movies are made and what goes onto the streaming service. And, you know, we know that Monsters, that, that franchise, is essentially moving to Disney Plus. And I'm very curious to know if that would be a possibility and if they would almost be better off doing that instead of an Incredibles 3, doing something on the Disney Plus streaming service and having the focus be on the kids and an older Jack-Jack. So that is definitely something to pay attention to because I cannot imagine that a movie that made $1.2 billion is just going to stand idle for the next 15 years again. Yeah, they can't let that happen because I know they Brad Bird kind of had control over that, but now that because of the streaming things have changed everything... Um, yeah, you can't play that waiting game anymore. You have to strike while the iron's hot, especially with these actors that are getting older. And, you know, you don't want to carry Fisher type situation. I hate to say something like that, but, you know, things like that might happen, you know. So you gotta, you have to fucking strike while the iron's hot and while the actors are still here together, willing to do the voices. All right, we covered one disappointing sequel this week. We are going to cover another disappointing sequel next week. At least for me, it was disappointing. Next week, Brian, let's discuss Deadpool 2. Um, yeah, man, because uh, there's going to be some interesting uh, post-potential Deadpool 3 discussions coming from that because God knows the rumors have been swirling with Spidey coming you know, in the Sony universe and coming back. Um, yeah, some things we can talk about next week that could be some really interesting potential sequels. A lot of things have changed in the last 18 months or so as far as Deadpool goes, and we are going to talk all about that next week. So for Brian, my name is Jerome. Thank you so much for listening. We will talk to you again next week. And remember, math is math. No matter how you get the goddamn answer, it's the same answer. As long as it's correct, it's fine. <laughs>